for this opportunity to meet you all and exchange across disciplines. Uh, I think it's been really uh, an exciting day and a half, um, and I know there are not many lawyers in the room, uh, but I think there's been quite a few uh, connections among the previous presentations that were made and, uh, and the one I want to share with you. Um, and I'll start by, with my conclusions and see whether um, by the end of the presentation they make sense to you and whether you have any questions um, and see the connections that I see with your own work. Um, I think that a, a good starting point is an admission that um, you would think that lawyers and, and justice and equity have a lot to say um, uh, to one another in a way, uh, but the reality is that there's a very widespread perception that international law and law maybe more generally haven't really contributed to the equity issues that you're all quite familiar with in the context of socio-ecological systems. That's not just a perception from outside the law. I would say that many lawyers share the same sense, uh, either because we think that it's not our job to discuss equity, we're technicians, we really have to look with what the law says and not necessarily think about what the law should do. Not all lawyers are like that, but many of us have been trained in that way or have been asked to work in that way by our uh, employees. Uh, but also I think many lawyers feel hesitant. They feel that not, not necessarily our discipline and the ways in which we are trained and discuss our uh, subject matter really are particularly helpful to address the very complex uh, multi-dimensional questions of, around equity that um, have been discussed in the past day. Uh, and my work has really been trying to see whether instead of rethinking law completely, thinking whether we need to create a whole new maybe whole new treaties and governance systems, whether maybe we have, we've been a bit blinded by that perception, which I think has a lot of truth in it, but still may have um, somehow maybe um, obscured some opportunities that already exist in international law to make a helpful contribution to justice, particularly when we bring other disciplines uh, in a dialogue with each other and when lawyers build upon and contribute um, to the findings in other disciplines. And so my own work is really focused on looking at how if we take together international biodiversity law and international human rights law, we are actually able to see how international law can contribute to justice issues, can provide clearer um, obligations on states that many governments would admit they have already subscribed to in terms of uh, several dimensions of justice, uh, they may also look at addressing justice issues across scales. Uh, I'm really mainly thinking, I guess, about um, uh, geographical scales, but there'll be a really interesting conversations to be had about other scales as well. And I think in this context, there's quite a lot that international law can say about good governance, the points that Oran made at the start of this conference. And really, actually, there's an argument to be made as a lawyer that we're not just looking at good practices. It is a matter of law that governments um, step up their game on certain equity issues that we have identified time and again in socio-ecological systems. And that is also true for companies. So many of you have discussed yesterday and today what we expect companies to do. Many have shared, I think again very fairly, that we may not necessarily have too much hope that private companies will contribute to the justice issues we are familiar with. And that whatever we have, the, the soft, the voluntary approaches to corporate social responsibility may not really, have not really made a difference. Uh, but again, if we look at international law as it is developing, we can have an argument that we're going beyond, we're already beyond purely voluntary approaches. We might not yet be in a clearly firm, legally binding terrain, but I think the expectations now are that international companies, but also smaller companies, local companies, cannot be indifferent to what international law says. And again, by, by looking at how international biodiversity law complements or can complement international human rights law, there's a few very specific steps that companies would have a hard time saying uh, they can completely ignore in their day-to-day -day practice and in their corporate decision-making structures. And I think there's a possibility there to link with the work that our colleagues shared this morning about the supply chain uh, assessments and the tracking along that and how maybe by bringing those two together we can have quite something quite powerful there. 
Um, and the last step in my discussion is that, well, while this idea of uh, the role of lawyers is interesting in thinking, well, this applies to governments, it applies to companies, it applies to everybody else but myself, the next step, step in my own uh, academic journey has really been thinking, well, what, what does this mean for researchers, for how we think about our own role in these discussions, our own research questions, so how are we self-reflexive about our role in power dynamics, um, and how does that play out then if we are engaging in inter- and transdisciplinary um, research efforts? Um, and again, I think one interesting finding, um, my own, uh, many lawyers I think would disagree, but there you go, is that um, I think we're going beyond research ethics. Many of the things that we consider good research practice are or are becoming a matter of international law. And I think the more we track very carefully where we are with the developments of international law in terms of what researchers and scientists have to do, the more we ourselves can play a role in using existing international law to address the justice questions that we, are, we have faced and we have identified in a socio-ecological system. So where, where are we starting from? There, there's a reason why lawyers don't engage so much in equity discussions. Um, there's no uniform understanding of what equity means from a legal perspective. That's something that our colleague mentioned at the start of this session. And yet, equity is an international principle of, uh, a general principle of international law. Uh, Oren spoke of principle yesterday, and I think from a legal perspective, this is quite powerful. General principles of international law are legal sources. They are law, but they are flexible, they are general, they're meant to inform more specific rules that we have in international law, either in terms of uh, informing the development of more specific rules or the interpretation of existing rules. But there's a very strong concern among lawyers, um, and one of the also basic pillars of international law, which is for how much we care about justice, we just come up, can't come up with our own subjective conceptions of justice. We need to think, we need to identify in the law where justice has been encapsulated and then using those rules to uh, pursue that notion of justice. Um, and that's, that's the struggle for, for lawyers and international law, uh, lawyers in particular. Now there are actually quite a lot of international rules that have to do with equity. Uh, in different areas, um, they are very relevant, I think, to, to the matters you're interested in as well. Uh, in the law of the sea, the protection of the marine environment, the sharing of marine resources. In international law, some were mentioned yesterday, common but differentiated responsibility, both in the context of biodiversity and climate change. Um, and interestingly enough, the one area where lawyers were not shy in addressing justice is the area of international investment law. That's the area of international law that protects corporations. Uh, so you can see that there's also a bit of an um, imbalanced approach in areas where governments do find agreements or we have um, powerful <laughs> interests, they use the law to ask for justice, and other areas where instead Either governments do not feel um, sufficient desire or sufficiently shared desire to equip law to really address justice, or where the, the interests are so complex that we can't quite um, get the legal tools that we need. But it doesn't mean that uh, at some point in time we're not, we will not be able to agree on certain instruments of international law that may correspond to our own aspirations of justice, but things can evolve. Um, and in fact, what's interesting, what's been interesting for me is looking at how different specific rules about equity in international law have been developing and have been communicating with each other and have influenced each other. Um, and some, some of the concepts that maybe had captured more the imagination of the international community, such as the idea of the common heritage of mankind, humankind, those haven't necessarily been developing a lot. And other ideas that maybe were a bit more construed in more narrow terms, and they remain quite problematic in what they really mean, such as fair and equitable benefit sharing, have actually developed in interesting ways, ways where we saw different interests uh, and we saw an evolution, and where maybe in those areas we may find uh, insights into how international law could be, where we have um, 
a notion of justice or different notions of justice and we can reflect whether even in the face of a more wide application that may seem to be uh, working against justice, there are possible other interpretations that can actually turn things around. So that's what's been my work for the past five years. Um, together with other two legal colleagues and a political sociologist, we've been looking at all the areas of international law where this idea of fair and equitable benefit sharing, which I'll explain in a minute, has come up. Um, it actually originates from the very first um, instrument uh, in international human rights law, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and it has to do with a very obscure right, which is the human right to science, which I speak at the end, but it's really very much about our own role as researchers. But the area in which it has flourished uh, is international biodiversity law, and particularly the Convention on Biological Diversity. Initially in a very specific um, area of bio-based innovation, but increasingly has been used and invoked in other areas, traditional areas of natural resource development, be that forest management, mining, fisheries, um, uh, increasingly also in the area of conservation, the creation of protected areas and the justice issues around it, and eventually has spread in different ways um, across areas related to freshwater, to development, climate change, land, oceans. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, I mean lawyers always need to put a lot of footnotes to what they say, so there's a lot more text in my slides that I will not speak to, but if you have questions, uh, of course we can discuss. But, but the main argument I want to make here is that my uh, key finding from the Benelux project is that for how much we often look at the Convention on Biological Diversity and we don't necessarily see a very strong instrument, a very influential instrument. It has been a forum where a remarkably open dialogue across worldviews has been entertained, where countries have discussed very different um, approaches to conservation and sustainable use, openly discussing ideologies, and where academics, um, NGOs, and representatives of indigenous peoples and local communities have influenced texts that have then been adopted by consensus by 196 parties, that's the whole world, with the exclusion of the US. And the US are still sitting in those rooms and uh, depending on the topics, listening quite intently to what the rest of the world agrees in that forum. And so to my mind, there is quite a lot in those, uh, in the treaty itself and in the decisions that have been adopted under that umbrella they speak to the issues of justice that many of us are interested in. Now by itself, that might not go very far, and in, if you read any of the decisions adopted under the convention, you'll probably be quite disappointed. They're very long and wordy. You don't necessarily see where they're going, but there's quite a lot of good ideas in there that have to do with the specifics of how we carry out um, environmental management. Now that's where human rights comes in, and this is really a development of the past three years. Uh, maybe in, it wasn't the making for a bit longer, but it has really become clear in the past couple of years that what has been decided under the Convention on Biological Diversity matters from a human rights perspective. That it is helpful to know how we respect human rights in the context of natural resource development, creation of protected areas, management of, say, fisheries resources. And so if we read these two sources of international law together, we can have something quite powerful and almost revolutionary compared to how normally we go about uh, natural resource development and environmental protection. And what human rights law does, that the Biodiversity Convention does not, is setting very clear limits. This is the minimum that we expect from governments to do this is the limit to discretion. Yes, there may be many ways in which you can ensure that you propose the creation of a protected area, taking into account uh, the land rights of indigenous peoples. There's many ways in which you can involve them in the discussion about a protected area. But there are some clear ways in which uh, you're not doing enough. Uh, and what that means is that only if we bring in human rights law, we are able to see where there may be a clear violation of international law in environmental decision making and where we have better chances um, to be able to go to justice with that. I mean, lots of questions there, but in a nutshell, I think that is quite something that would 
quite different from what we normally hear under the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, why is that important? Because at the moment, current research, mainly outside of the legal area, socio-ecological research shows that um, whenever we use benefit sharing, we usually make a mess. We usually just either compound existing power imbalances, uh, we end up having maybe at best a rubber stamping exercise, we may um, benefit, share benefits with some communities and exclude others, we may favor elite capture. We might even um, contribute to inherently, inherently exploitative trends um, in the environmental and natural resource uh, context. So there is a lot of evidence about how in practice benefit sharing does not work. But there's a lot of learning there about how things could be done differently. And thinking about our conversation on interdisciplinarity, to me as a lawyer, that is invaluable. That shows me all the blind spots that I'm suffering from in my own discipline. But it also shows that my colleagues working in socio-ecological research are missing out on some opportunities. Usually their findings stop at saying, well, the law doesn't really empower uh, communities to have a say. The law fell short and did not prohibit unsustainable practices. But they can never go beyond and say, well, what should the law then say? Or can we use the law in a different way? And that's where lawyers and socio-ecological researchers working together may make a difference and may together find the appropriate ways to use those international instruments in a specific context and taking into account um, all the contextual evidence that has, uh, has been surfaced through non-legal research. Um, and to me, this idea of fair and equitable benefit sharing, as I said, not many lawyers are particularly hopeful about it. Um, but there are, it, over time, I think, the interpretation that has either been adopted by consensus by 196 states uh, with inputs from uh, indigenous peoples representatives, NGOs, um, and the interpretation that is coming out from international human rights tribunals and experts is that, okay, maybe fair and equitable in itself doesn't say much. If we look at all the treaties in which this expression is used, none really say anything about it. It's kind of assumed that we're working towards something fairer and more equitable, but really we leave it to a later stage. I mean, clearly we need a contextual negotiation, but we don't say very much about how that negotiation should be undertaken, and we don't monitor internationally whether or not those negotiations are really leading to fair and equitable results. So to me, actually the most important element of benefit sharing as a legal concept is the idea of sharing. And this is where, over time, we got some clarity about this is not just about an exchange. I'll give you access to my genetic resources, and you'll give me some money down the line if you develop a, a powerful drug. It's really about saying we're building gradually a partnership. This is not a one-off relationship where I tick a box, I get your consent, and off I go. It's really about understanding where the different parties are coming from, what their concerns are, having a dialogue about that, uh, and over an iterative process, developing a more long-lasting relationship that is based on respect, on trust, on mutual learning. Um, and then the notion of benefits then becomes something more complex than what we usually hear. There's not just about the monetary and non-monetary benefits, which in most cases has revealed itself as a false dichotomy, because any non-monetary benefit we can think of, capacity building, access to labs, access to research vessels, all of that has costs. And on the other hand, monetary benefits may really not be what is important for human well-being and for trustful relationships. So we have many examples in the mining sector, in the forestry sector of profit sharing as a result of um, industry community agreements, and that usually leads to catastrophic results, uh, or at least not very helpful results for communities it can be very divisive. Usually the profit is really not um, uh, proportional to what companies or the government are making from um, natural resource development. Um, so the idea is that we and, we, and we find some really helpful guidance from the African uh, Commission on Peoples and Human Rights, saying, well, what this really is about is through the dialogue and the mutual understanding, really understanding what would be a positive contribution from the proposed development in the eyes, from the perspective of particularly the least powerful interlocutors in this discussion. 
And for, for the Commission, if we look at this in terms of human rights, that has to do with the choice and the capabilities uh, in that particular case of indigenous peoples and local communities. So not any benefit will do, even if I get a really great offer for a company about building roads and schools and giving me internet for my whole village, is that what I really want? Is that what's going to make a difference for my own exercise of the freedom of choice, for my own control over my resources, which may be uh, severely limited by whatever development is being proposed? And how are my capabilities to exercise more and more uh, my own choice uh, really being enhanced by this agreement or not? And of course, th there's always a risk with focusing on benefits that we are overshadowing other important conversations about costs and risks and burdens. But I think what's interesting here is that we're moving away from a concept, which I think is really very much everyday practice of saying, well, we're really into a damage control situation. We need development, we need to go ahead, there'll be winners and losers, we're just gonna limit damage as much as we can. Whereas we're taking two steps back and saying, well, is there even a benefit that um, a, a government from the Global South, that an indigenous peoples group would even see from their own perspective in this proposed deal? And that's really changing the conversation uh, really altogether. And I think that's where in this idea of a dialogue, of building a partnership through mutual understanding and a genuine engagement with the different priorities and even notions of what nature is, what development is, what choice is, that we can address uh, very different dimensions of justice. We're not just looking at distribution, be that of money or otherwise, we are looking at procedure, uh, due um, transparency and real voice for that dialogue to be genuine, we're looking at recognition, recognizing different sources of knowledge, different views, uh, different contributions uh, that we can make to uh, the environment, and, and the kind of contextual justice, so capabilities and opportunities. So there is the potential there, uh, and it is a matter of saying, well, can we maybe change the current practice through legal persuasion, through collaboration, through good examples, and see whether this different approach um, can actually work. Now, I, um, m most of my work in this area has really focused on um, local and, let's say, national dynamics. Uh, so really looking at how this idea of free, um, of fair and equitable benefit sharing can work um, with the idea of prior environmental impact assessment and free prior informed consent. Um, so really looking at the local level relationships between governments and indigenous peoples or local communities within their own territory. And that's where we have seen the most uh, international legal developments. Uh, I have listed them there, I'm not gonna go into the details. Um, of course, just to mention that different lawyers would agree or disagree with my own arguments. Uh, but I think the, there is certainly, I think for uh, the vast majority of governments, it will be very difficult for them to argue that on the basis of their existing treaty obligations, they are all not expected to take that approach to benefit sharing that I just outlined as something as a genuine engagement to understand um, what would be the positive, uh, potential positive outcomes ar arising from a proposed development on lands that are traditionally used or owned by indigenous peoples from the perspective of those uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. Just because that is really the standard that is expected in terms of truly seeking their free prior informed consent. And this is something that's very different from compensation. Uh, it can be additional to it, but it is to be distinguished. And it has both procedural and substantive dimensions. I mean, all of these steps could be just procedural, but there is an important interplay with the real realization and effective protection of the substantive rights uh, that are at stake here. Um, and what's interesting for, for the purposes of our discussion on corporate social responsibility is that the same understanding about the role of governments has also then been um, developed for the understanding of what we expect from private companies that wish to engage uh, and to propose developments in indigenous lands or traditional communities' lands. Of course, we don't expect the same behavior from governments and companies, but we expect um, that companies will also take those standards into account and be uh, really engaging in a, in a partnership building process as opposed to a 
kind of social acceptability process in their engagements with um, indigenous peoples and local communities. Now, why does this matter? I mean, as a lawyer, um, I did get very excited with my project and I thought there's a huge potential that has not been tested in courts. I've met many activists who think, well, there's nothing in international law for them to use when they go before national courts. And I think that maybe things are changing now, uh, but we still, uh, we still need to see what different courts may, may, may make of this approach. But I think what was really important for me beyond kind of getting hard evidence that the legal argument is, um, is a winning one, let's say, is that having done a little bit of field work with my um, political sociologist colleague, a colleague in different countries, in different regions, in different sectors, and with communities that had different access to power, um, all these communities had the same, well, very similar underlying calls uh, for how they expected to be treated fairly in the context of environmental management. And all these um, calls do find resonance uh, in the legal arguments we've been developing uh, in relation to international law. So all these aspects are, we find uh, guidance and more and more specific guidance in international law as to how this should be done by governments as to what, company, um, have, what companies are expected to do as well uh, with regards to these calls. So at the very least what this shows is that for how much all the communities we met uh, a bit briefly did not have any particular hope that international law could help and, and most of their legal advisors thought there was no point in even engaging with international law. Our research showed that actually there is quite a lot that international law is already responding to in terms of, in the terms related to equity that those communities themselves and their advisors have identified as crucial for them to realize their own view of uh, development. Now, we're moving now into a, a more speculative, well, the first one is already speculative to some extent, but there's been a lot of legal developments that can, I think, beef up um, a legal argument. We can move the same reason into the area of knowledge production and co-production. And as I said at the start, um, the very first reference to benefit sharing in international law is related to science and to the right that everyone has to freely participating in cultural life and to enjoy the benefits of scientific advancements. So what does that mean? Well, there's both an obligation for those um, having a, a driving scientific research, be they researchers, to my mind also being funders, um, but there's also an entitlement uh, for all of us to, well, how, how does our entitlement to benefit from research um, really spells out in terms of government obligations and possibly also private companies' responsibilities. And that's where I think we can see more clearly maybe the cross-scalar cross -scalar, um, interplay here. There's both an aspect that maybe is the best known uh, about how we have um, state obligations um, and company responsibilities when we wish to draw on the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities to advance science. Uh, we had some examples yesterday, I think, of colleagues that have engaged. And I think what's becoming really clear there is that even when we're not planning to use traditional knowledge for commercial purposes, but we are planning to integrate traditional knowledge to support um, traditional knowledge holders in having a voice in research, in having a voice in climate science or biodiversity science, that is still car carries obligations. We still need to engage in a process of respectful, iterative, partnership building process. Um, and we've seen that, that you know, it's not just maybe the local connection between our researchers, be that local or foreign, and um, a traditional knowledge holder. We've seen in the example at IPBS that was mentioned yesterday, that that can happen in different scales, and we can have transnational and international experiments in that engagement, and a lot to be learned there about what is working, what is fed that is being a fair and equitable sharing of benefits and what maybe is not working and equally needs to be documented and reflected upon. Then there's, there's another aspect which is really something that as um, environmental practitioners we're quite familiar. We know that many governments have um, accepted really left and right in, ev in every international agreement they've signed obligations to engage in scientific cooperation, 
to share uh, technology and to um, also build capacity. And again, we understand that we all have a, a stake in addressing global environmental challenges. We're not all uh, equally equipped to do it, but whether we are equally equipped or not, we need to work together to address those challenges. Now, those are the obligations in international law that are the least implemented. I've never been to an international meeting where countries haven't said, not enough has been done, uh, not enough has been done in terms of bringing funding to biodiversity or climate change. We don't see enough, we don't see enough scientific cooperation. Not technology is really being transferred or not enough. So this is an area where, for how much we have um, international obligations, there's not much action. And one of the reasons is that um, those obligations, again, leave a lot of room for discretion for governments, uh, and particularly donor governments. We have systems to track now, to see whether we're moving towards targets, but that's not really made a difference. And one of the interesting things, if we bring the human rights dimension into it, is saying, well, again, this is not just good governance, it's not just a good idea that scientific, more scientific research and cooperation will help us reach international agreements, objectives, but if we don't do it, every time we fall short of those financial, technological, uh, solidarity obligations, there are human rights uh, violations, there are human rights implications at least. There will be people who will suffer in their potentially basic human rights uh, because of that shortcoming in international cooperation. Now legally, that is um, an argument that I think still needs to be worked through. But it that just shows that, again, from a legal perspective, by bringing together two, um, two different areas of law, we can look at different aspects, and particularly cross-scalar dimensions of justice there. And just seeing, well, that's not just a global south, global north dynamic. There's lots of human rights of different people in different countries that will be affected and are already being affected because we don't cooperate enough or co-develop technology. And here again, what, what I see is that uh, international biodiversity law and international human rights law really complement each other. They say different things about this issue, and by bringing them together, we can have really quite something powerful to at least challenge current practices. So on the biodiversity side, what we have is maybe, um, let's say, open-ended obligations, but we have quite a lot of examples and very inventive mechanisms about how we can advance with scientific cooperation, including across scales. And so, for instance, in the case of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, we have this beautiful benefit sharing mechanism, which is a global fund where researchers and farmers develop together certain projects that are local in nature, but can have global benefits. Um, and through the international mechanism, receive funding, participate in knowledge exchange, Again, it's not a perfect mechanism. There's quite a lot of lessons that have been learned about how, while in principle it was aimed at equity, it didn't necessarily support maybe those um, farmer organizations that were less competitive in preparing project proposals, and there have been responses to that. But I think what's interesting there is that we have something very concrete where we can learn a lot and improve a lot. So a very concrete sense of how we address this equity issue of science and scientific cooperation in practice. What international human rights law brings is again some limits, some very clear minimum standards. And those usually are not talked about in international biodiversity law. So the question of non-discrimination, who's really participating and who's left out? Are we all equally contributing to research? What if our research questions are always determined by the same group of people and we're really always missing out on the more on the needs of the, of the most vulnerable and are we protecting against all negative consequences including environmental ones uh, those that will be most uh, um, most exposed to them uh, because of our scientific efforts um, so i think that there's quite an agenda there about how international law can either shed light or confirm our own sense of the justice um, questions that face our own work and can also guide our work in the future. And I had some slides about my own work in the future, but I've run out of time. So if, if you're interested in seeing how I'm applying this thinking in a new project on the oceans, uh, together with marine scientists, um, social scientists, artists, lawyers, and, and uh, policy experts, uh, let's talk over coffee. But not now. <laughs>
<laughs> and everything is online over all our research, so it would be great to have your comments.